Lord willing, we'll have a good day today in the Lord. Take your Bible, come to Ephesians chapter number 6. Now, I think you probably know that things are entirely different in what people perceive as Christianity today than they were even as little as a year ago. And uh, things are going to continue to change. Uh, the battle used to be more for souls than it is now, but now it's almost the last-ditch effort to do everything they can to try to pull a Christian away from his fellowship with the Lord. And it's a constant battle, and it never, it never will cease. Uh, the, the Bible teaches you clearly that in the last days, they'll heap to themselves teachers after their own lust, having itching ears, and be turned away from the truth unto fables. And now what you're beginning to see and what people are recognizing or what they're calling Christian churches is, is you're seeing more that are involved in uh, political events. They're involved more in things that are going on in the world today. They're more interested in the here and now than in the hereafter. And you're starting to have or feel this pressure that if you're, quote, a Christian, that you're supposed to be involved in all of these things that are happening in the world today, which, by the way, changes constantly. Uh, there's no consistency there. There's a tremendous amount of inconsistency. But they're beginning, instead of letting the Bible uh, uh, shape our, th our thinking for what a Christian should be, what they're beginning to do is, is they're starting to try to let the world shape your idea of what the church ought to be. And the Lord predicts that. The Lord tells you that those are the things that are going to take place. So what am I supposed to do? Well, the simple thing to do is, is that you're supposed to make a stand. Now, there's certain things that we don't recognize, and it sounds almost silly to say, well, you make a stand. But you have to pick what you stand on, what hill you're willing to die on. And uh, there are certain things in the Bible that you have to recognize, and before you start fighting all the things in the world going on, and when I say this, I want to be careful that you understand. When I say what I'm going to say, listen to my explanation of it before you immediately turn me off. The church doesn't have an issue. Come on in, Brother Sam. Are you feeling any better at all? Smidgen. Um, the, 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 the church doesn't have any business being involved in uh, the abortion rights issue. I didn't say I agree with abortion. I understand all the millions of babies that have been killed, and I understand all those things and that kind of a deal, but that's not our main thing. Our church is not involved in who's at war and who's not at war. Those are things, let the United Nations or whoever wants to handle that kind of stuff. And the only time that it affects us is when it's contrary to the Bible. I've told you to be very, very cautious, to be very careful, uh, especially when it comes to that land that's over there in uh, Israel right now. Now, some of you are going to get mad at me because of the things I'm going to cover because you've been involved in all this political stuff as if changing things in the United States of America is going to change things in the world. It doesn't. What you're supposed to do is go by the king that's coming and the world that's in the hereafter, and you're not supposed to be worried. America's going to be wiped out. Who's going to be in the presidency and who's going to do that? Where are the preachers that had you support one candidate a few years ago, and now all the dirty, filthy stuff is coming out? I know you believe it's all a conspiracy and things like that, but how come they're not coming out and saying, well, we advised you the wrong way? Why'd you advise them at all? I don't care who you vote for. 70% of the Jews in this country right now are Democratic. 70%. What are you going to do? Say they're not God's chosen people because they choose the wrong party? Now you tell me what good it is to waste God's time and God's pulpit to talk about whether or not somebody is a particular party. Uh, what you're starting to see now is, is you're seeing people that are equating themselves to the, to the Jews over there. They don't even realize what happened historically. And I've told you that stuff. And I told you originally when the whole thing with, quote, Palestine, end quote, uh, started, it was their own people running themselves out and said that if they found people still staying in that land, that wasn't Israel running them out, wasn't England running them out. It was their own, uh, their own people running them out and said, if we catch you in the land, we'll hang you as a traitor. And then two and a half million of them moved back in and not a single one of them was there originally. But you see, you don't read and you don't know that. So now what you hear is, is the West Bank, the West Bank, the West Bank. You want me to be political for you for a minute? 
A bank is like uh, on the side of a river or a pond or something. It's not 20 miles wide right. and 100 and something miles long. Right. But see, some of you are already, well, what about the atrocities? Did you forget about the atrocities that have been going on for hundreds of years against the nation of Israel? I told you already, they signed two times, two different times to uh, get rid of, desecrate the Balcor, Balfour uh, Declaration that was done in 48 to give them that land over there and came in twice behind that and signed it that saying that it's no longer any good. But who reads? And Churchill paying people while well, they're killing Jews in Germany, paying uh, other countries not to allow the Jews to flee to the land of, uh, uh, back to the land of Israel. Paying nations not to let them go back where they're supposed to go back to. Well, that's paying, paying to have them killed. We'll give you money if you just let them stay until we catch them and eliminate them. I'm, I'm not sure if you're really a Bible believer or not. You know what that Bible says? That Bible says that after the Lord left out over there in uh, the Garden of Gethsemane, when they brought Him back in, He came in through that eastern gate and God Himself said, there isn't anybody else going to come through the eastern gate until my prince comes through the gate. And now that wall's been cemented shut. And then the Muslims went out there and buried all their dead out there. Because you're not supposed to desecrate it and come across the dead people to come in the eastern gate. They must believe the Bible more than some of you. You say, well, when is he going to come through there? He'll come through there at the second coming. And the concrete wall ain't going to hold him back. He'll land on the Mount of Olives. And as soon as he puts his foot down, he'll split. The earthquake will take place. And he's coming through there and you're coming through there with him. You say, well, what about the people that are buried there? He doesn't care about them. Now, I'm not trying to be harsh with you, but what do I do practically in my own personal life? And the devil is trying his best to destroy the church, not from without, from within. And there's things you have to do individually. You have to take account of yourself, pay attention to yourself. It's not about what everybody else is doing. I've been hearing that for the last three or four weeks. Well, everybody else does. My parents must have got so frustrated with me because a lot of my excuses were when I asked to do something, they said no. I would retort with, well, everybody else does it. Well, that meant that it was wrong. If everybody else was doing it, my dad's response was, "You going to just, uh, everybody sticks their head in the fire, are you going to join them? That was his response. What that was is a nice way of saying, well, good, then that's a good reason for you not to do it. Everybody else doing it. Who's the everybody? Everybody else is not doing it. And so one of the things that happens is, is in the last days, what do I need to do? Because the last days things are changing and you need strength from each other. You don't need to wink in the hands of your brothers and sisters that are doing their best to stand just like you're standing. You need to be able to come to a place that's called a sanctuary, a place where you can come in and with like-minded believers and like-minded people to get away from all of that stuff. You shouldn't come to church and have to be exposed to filth and foolishness and all that foul stuff going on. You should come to church. Why? It's a clean place to be able to come to. And so when you come to gather here, it's like, well, I'm coming here because I want to get away from all that stuff. All right, look in Ephesians chapter number 6. Father, bless your word this morning. Help us in this little Bible study, we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. And we'll pick it up in Ephesians chapter number 6. Look in verse number... Uh, 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the world. What's the armor to protect you from? It's to protect you from the devil. First thing you have to do is, and look in verse number 12, you have to recognize who the enemy is. All the devil wants to do is get you out. And the best way to get you out is create or cause a division. Six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination to Him. And you come down through that whole thing there, and one of those abominations to the Lord is He that soweth discord among the brethren. Now there's a time and a place where you draw a line and say, I'm not going to be in part of that or be involved with that. But I can tell you this, ladies and gentlemen, you have to take stand on doctrinally sound things. What will cause schisms and splits is talking and arguing about something you don't know anything about, flat earth. Sovereign citizen. Using the Bible to justify rebellion even though Romans 13 screams against it. 
Now you get in a big argument with people about that stuff. And then you start teaching your kids about that stuff. Uh, by the way, flat earth didn't come from a Bible believer. You say, well, I know if you shoot up a rocket and it does this and I do that and I know both sides of the argument, the bottom line is, why are we arguing about it at all? I guess we'll see when we get there. Yeah. You know, it's a big conspiracy to keep you from knowing that you haven't been to the edge of the earth. <laughs> well, who's been to the edge of the earth? Well, they think there's an ice wall out there. They think there's an ice wall out there. Well, you know, the astronauts have been up there in space and you've had people that are doing the test pilots have been up there in the extra atmosphere up there. They just shot down a missile 62 miles high, so that would be considered into the solar system. And all of those things register that it's circular, but it's a conspiracy because all of the pictures that have been coming in since pictures have been coming from that with horizons and all that other stuff, all of that is photoshopped and the whole thing is a conspiracy. <laughs> Man, you can't even get two people to have a conspiracy without there being a leak in it. But the point is, is that now you're arguing about that. Here's a good argument. Let's argue about the blood-sucking angels from Jupiter. Okay, well, they may be there. Do you know they are or not? How'd they get here in Genesis 6? They fell. How'd they reproduce? I can speculate, but I'm not going to argue with you about it. It's speculation. Women in heaven... Well, if you're a woman, you're probably thinking to yourself right now, that ain't too, I mean, you know, I mean, the Bible does say that, you know, there's silence in heaven. It must be before you got there, or either there's none there. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. Uh, but I can't say when you're conformed to his image, if that's a literal, physical, absolute image of it, and you want to argue about it, okay, we'll see when we get there. I know your soul is uh, not what you see as far as what's on the outside. The souls must be somewhat similar. They must look somewhat the same. What does a soul look like? Casper the ghost? <laughs> you don't know. It's shaped like your body. But who says it has the image of the body as far as recognition? I can't tell you what the answer to that is. And then when your body is changed into a body like His, does that mean eternal least for perspective? Or does that mean that you're all going to look just like Him? Well, could be you all look just like Him. The point is, is that I can't say for absolute sure. You want to get sidetracked on that? Good. How does it help you in your everyday walk with Jesus Christ? I mean, that's all I'm trying to get across to you. You want to get in an argument about that. You want to get in an argument about Genesis 1-1 and 1-2? I think you'll miss half the Bible if you, if you don't believe what's there. But you want to get in an argument about it? It doesn't change how you live. Practically, how do you live every day? Whether you believe that or not doesn't affect your rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. But you want to argue about that. You know the majority of arguments, the arguments that I'm aware of, the arguments that I know about, have to do with people arguing about things that are at best speculative. You could not present them in a court of law, and most people that speak as an expert would not be certified as an expert in a court of law, and therefore what they say is just a bunch of hot air. They're just speculating on things. Well, it looks this way. Listen, if you go in your mind and you think to yourself, I'm going to find reason to do something uh, that's wrong to do, I think I'm going to go rob a bank. Well, the tabernacle of Rosbers prosper. I got that from the old preacher. You say, well, it's okay to neck in the parking lot and to make out and to do things you shouldn't. Come to Bethel and transgress. If you don't rightly divide your Bible, man, you can justify anything. Have a little wine. Better get the rest of that. <laughs> For thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. But you got to compare that with the other scriptures, about 50-something of them or 60-something of them that are there that have to do with getting it. You can go to the Bible and pretty much find anything you want to find. How do you know that? You ever realize how many cults are out there? You ever realize how many other religions are out there? They all have a Bible verse. Right? Uh, Peter, upon this rock, I'll build my church. They didn't rightly divide that. You say, what do you have? You have a whole Roman organization built on that. Uh, 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 let's see, uh, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ and you shall receive the Holy Ghost. You have a whole religion built on that. Right. Now we believe in baptism but not for salvation. Amen. You don't even have to be baptized to be saved or go to heaven. Right. 
You can get saved on your deathbed and step perhaps into the body and present with the Lord and whether you've ever been dunked or not doesn't make any difference at all. But we believe that. You have a number of those things. What are they all? They all have Scripture. Uh, here's a good one for you. Over in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians at the end of 15, on the right-hand page there, the 1 Corinthians 15, baptism for the dead. The whole Mormons make a whole deal that they go out there to Utah or they go down south of here. I think it's uh, Tampa where they have the big pool that's up there with 12 oxen that are around it. And you go up there and you get dunked for your dearly departed loved ones. And if you get baptized for them, you get to move them from hell into a, a, a populating celestial outer space. That's where you'll be rejoined with your family up there. They have a difficult time with that because part of them are 144,000. The rest of them, they can't figure out where they go. But they'll go down there and be baptized for you. That's why they're interested in the family tree. By the way, all your DNA stuff and all that other stuff, the part of what happened with that wasn't just criminal. Part of that was is trying to find out who your ancestors were so you could be baptized and move them out. You can't be an atonement for your brethren. Amen. I don't care how close they are to you. Listen, I don't mean offense by what I'm about to say. If your mama died without Jesus Christ, she's in hell. Amen. Because of a decision your mother made. Not because she wasn't a nice woman and not because she doesn't care about you. Not because she didn't take care of you. Has nothing to do with that. It's because she rejected Jesus Christ. And you can't get baptized and move her and change her into that. They got verses for it. It's not correct. That passage that he's talking about there is people being baptized for the people that are out here that are lost. They're dead in trespasses and sin. And when they see the baptism, they're like, well, what does that represent? That represents my salvation. Salvation, buried with Him and raised again the newness of life. That's what that has to do with it. It's a picture of your salvation. But what is it? You have to recognize who your enemy is. Your enemy is, is to God get you, I mean the devil gets you on anything except what God says. Anything. Yea, hath God said, started in Genesis 3. Did God really say that? Does God really mean that? You question it, you confuse it, you make it hard, you make it difficult. Leave that to the Bible scholars. Stay, stay on the simple side of things. I'm not telling you don't study. He says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 1 Timothy 6 says, give attention to reading. You should be reading your Bible, but you come to things you don't understand, write it down and keep moving. Don't wind up making it your pet doctrine where you just get fixated on it. You get the privilege of going places and seeing people. They'll always come up with something they're an expert in. All they do is study flat earth. They don't study anything else. And so they'll come up at a meeting and ask you. They'll walk up and say, you know, well, what do you think about flat earth? The last one that did that to me, and I guess this will go out now, so just we'll go ahead and say it. Uh, what do you think about flat earth? I said, you're right. Uh, you're, it's flat. And he said, you don't believe that. And I, you know, in my mind, I said, answer a fool according to his folly. <laughs> I said, you're right. No argument. And he goes, you don't believe that. And I said, you came to argue? I'm not arguing with you. You're right. There's a whole bunch of people standing there. He picked the platform. He knew exactly what he was doing. And he came up and shot his mouth off right there. And I just said, you're right. It's flat. I don't, you know, no problem at all. I said, that stuff's way over my head, man. And I went back to talk. You don't believe that. And I said, I'm not here to argue with you. I said, you're right. You win the argument. No problem. And I went to talk again. And he goes, but you don't believe that. And I said, what are you getting so jacked up about? You win the argument. You say, what did he want to do? He wanted to give me all of his verses and all of his reasons why he figured it out. And at the end of that argument, what will we have proven? Because it would still be people standing around going, well, I don't believe that. Well, that's foolishness. Well, that's crazy. Oh, well, I believe that. So now I'm on the flat earth side and the non-flat earth side. And here's what you're encouraged to do. Well, now you should study your Bible. and, and Your Bible study is not intended for you to get off on extremes and extremities. You've got to keep a balance on those things. Amen. You know, that, you can't use that to hide behind to say that people are trying to prevent you from studying the Bible when you find stuff that goes along with where you're thinking you're smarter than everybody else. I wouldn't be fool enough to come out with something like that. You say, well, preacher, you're a pretty big fool. Maybe in other things, but I know better than to speak on something that I don't have the scientific background to back it up and just parrot whatever anybody says that, I, that falls in line with what I believe. 
You have to take a stand, ladies and gentlemen, and recognize your enemy is the devil and all he's trying to do is get you to question the Bible and then get you to create discord among the brethren, arguing over things that don't amount to a row of pins, a handful of peas. You're, you're fussing and arguing and creating divisions because you don't recognize that's where the devil started in Genesis 3. It caused the division between the wife and the husband over something. Yeah, yet God said, yeah, He said it. That settles it. Well, what do you think about it? It doesn't matter what I think about it. The idea that I'm going to hypothetically sit around and stroke my beard and pause and ponder and think that I'm right up there with God when I see some things that are in the Bible and then all of a sudden I'm thinking, well, boy, that'll, that'll be... That's like the, the, new, the, the, the Berean, the new Athenians over there always looking for something new. Well, how about just dealing with the old? I mean, you're at the bottom of those things. Here's a good one for you to postulate for a while. Why'd God save your miserable hide? You don't deserve to be saved, neither do I. Why'd God do that? Think on that one a while. You know what that'll do? That'll shut you down. That'll help you from strutting around like a peacock and making you think, and you're, oh man, boy, look at me. Look what I know. I, I know something nobody else knows. Well, it may not even be worth knowing. That's why you're the only one that knows it. Not teaching it for a class. Listen, at the heart of that is a rebellious nature that I just got to find something to argue about. The devil is about creating divisions and causing trouble for you and creating discord. And whenever you see that, you got to recognize, I hate to tell some of you this because you don't believe it. Look in verse, I guess it'll be 12 there. Doesn't he say, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood? Yes, Your enemies, not each other. Is that what he said? Yeah. Why he spends so much time at each other's throat? Amen. Good preaching. So that means I have to get along with everybody? No, it means at certain times you have to draw a line, but you shouldn't be spending all your time arguing with them. Amen. Amen. Some of you come to church, and boy, it's a great blessing. We had a big meeting over here, and I appreciate all y'all did. You stepped up, man, the last two or three weeks, man. You turned on the afterburners, and we managed to get over 600 people in that thing, and we're still getting texts and emails and phone calls, and y'all were a real blessing. Y'all were a real blessing. I mean, you minister to those people and you did all those other things, but we had people over here, they're from different parts of the country, they're different culture, and they're a little different. And they say some different things. And some of them are weird. And I'm sure we were weird to some of them. But it's like a family reunion. I don't dismiss my family just because they're weird. They're my family. And I pray God will fix them. <laughs> but doesn't that Bible say you're not wrestling against flesh and blood? Well, you know, only a prideful individual makes it a wrestling match against each other. I'm going to do what God says. I've got to recognize behind that thing is a devil somewhere creating a problem. All right, so the first thing you want to do is to take a stand for the right thing for the right reason and don't get distracted from, uh, by fighting the wrong things. Don't get into an argument. There's a whole lot of controversy right now uh, over what's going to happen in 2024. The rapture. Amen. Yes, sir. So you don't know that. Yeah, but what if it did all the time you spent arguing about who you're going to vote for in November of 2024 as if you're going to be here? Right. Who said you're going to be here? Amen. If statistics are true, some of y'all are going to be dead. The way the world's going, sometimes I feel like I'm going to be right at the top of the list. I mean, you don't know that. You know what you're better off doing? You're better off instead of getting involved in all that kind of stuff. How do you, you, get as riled, you get as riled up about things of God as you do about political things? You get, as, you get more riled up at a football game or a soccer game or a basketball game or at your wife or at your husband than you do when somebody crosses the book. Come on. The battle's for the book, ladies and gentlemen. It's not for this piece of dirt we're on. And you've got to recognize that. Well, but what's going on in Israel right now, preaching all I don't know. I can tell you this. They're involved in it. And if they're involved in it, they got God's attention. Where's it going to go? I don't know. I've been looking at it historically. 
You say, what's going to happen? The blood moons in the Shemitahs? Shemitah is just a Jewish word for a seven-year period of time. That's all that means. That's a big word to make you think, oh, they know something I don't know. There's a reason why Shemitah is not in your Bible. Because the Lord is not interested in whether or not oh, it's a seven-year period of time. And during the seven-year period of time, we have blood moons. Uh, okay. Historically, here we go. Now you're going to speculate. And now you're going to have the woman jumping through a hoop up there, and you're going to fulfill the... Now you're, now you're so far out of rightly dividing the Bible, it isn't even funny. But you get wrapped up in that. When's the rapture going to be? I don't know. Come on. Any minute, I don't know. I might die before the rapture. The issue is, are you ready to die? I'm not talking about just being saved. I'm talking about ready to face Him at the judgment seat. And if you're not, He don't get up there and say to you, what was your position on the flat earth? I think He might respond to you like Job. Hey Job, before I answer your question, if you can answer this, I'll talk to you. Where were you when I, and 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 where were you when I? You're going to match wits with me, boy. I'll talk to you when you answer those questions. No, sir, Lord, you're on a whole nother level. I'll just accept there's some things you didn't intend for me to know. And so guess what, Lord, I'm, I, I'm, I'm done. Sorry, sir, let me get back to things I can understand. Amen. And stick with the simplicity of things. Yes, sir. That complex stuff. It, you know what it does? You know, me to be honest with you? It puffs you up. It makes you prideful. It makes you think you know something somebody else doesn't know. Amen. Well, I know Jesus Christ. Amen. And there's a lot of people that don't know Him. Amen. And beyond that, when church becomes this cesspool of what's the new thing out, ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you, you get your focus off of Jesus Christ, and the next thing you don't realize is sitting right next to you is somebody that's going through hurt and pain and disaster and trouble and difficulties and uncertainty and unsurety, and they need some help. And guess what? You turn to them and say, hey, listen, today when search is over, let's go to lunch and discuss with you the flat earth. I got some new revelation on it. Okay. Great. Really helps me. Uh, right now I'm kind of going through a difficult time. Well, this will get your mind off of it. Number one, stand for the right things. I'm not going to get far in this right here, but it it uh, something that just needs to be repeated. Don't let too many uh, saboteurs in the church weaken, weaken from behind the lines the things that are important for you. Uh, the seven mysteries that need to be uh, repeated, and the baptisms, and the, uh, the, the resurrections, and all those kinds of things that are important to you. The judgment seat of Christ, important to you, instead of all those other things. Secondly, look if you will please in verse number uh, 12 again. Principalities, powers against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Hold your ground. It says to st oh, ground. It says to stand. Uh, that means not just perpendicularly. That doesn't mean like I'm standing here. It just means hold your ground. Having it all to stand, what? Stand. There are certain things worth dying for. I'm not going to plant my heel on whether uh, uh, my, my uh, uh, flag and die on the hill of whether or not you should or shouldn't wear shorts. That's not a conviction worth dying for to me. Maybe it is for you. The way I hear some people preach it, they must believe that it's worth dying for. Because all you're doing is paying attention to the flesh. And you think that because you don't wear them, that it makes you more spiritual than somebody else. Now why am I saying this? You want to make sure that the stand you're taking is God's stand. Most of you wouldn't have talked to the woman at the well. You say, why? She was improperly attired. She had a bad past. She had been with five other men that weren't her husband, but they're somebody else's husband. I mean, if there was ever an adulterer, she was an adulterer. She has to come out to draw water in the middle of the day where nobody else would go in the heat of the day. She's, that's where the bad people come. And most of you wouldn't, you wouldn't have anything to do with that. You've taken a stand on the wrong things as if being saved made you different than you are. It saved your soul, but that old man is still right there. Right. Yeah. 
you had two hands before you got saved, uh, you still got two hands. If you lost a leg before you got saved, that leg didn't come back on you when you got saved. Those habits you had before you got saved are still right there. And if you don't do everything you can to walk in the Spirit and stand on the things that are right to stand on, you have to be careful. You know, one of the things that's important for you is come by your conviction slowly. I know about this. You say, why? I've eaten a lot of crow. Sometimes you think you'd die for it, and then when push comes to shove, you realize, you know, I don't really know that I want to die for that. I'll die for the Bible. I'll die for eternal security. I'll die for salvation by grace through faith and through the blood of Jesus Christ. Those kinds of things. Those are things that are unmovable. But as far as the other things that are traditions, that this is what you want to do, you want to be careful. You want to be, you don't, you don't necessarily want to draw a line on all those things. You say, well, you sound like a compromiser. You must not run around with me very much. If you ran around with me very much at all, you'd know I'm not a compromiser. But my standards are not necessarily your standards. Some of you got the standards of an alley cat. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Some of the things you do, you would not do if I was there or somebody else. One of the deacons was there, one of the trustees. You wouldn't do that. That's some of you. But you can still come to church. So what are we doing? Working on it. I don't want you to adopt my standards. Adopt His standards. And if you want to grieve the Holy Spirit and not do what He tells you to do when He tells you to do it, fine. That's your business until it interrupts what we're trying to get done here. I'm not here to just change you on the outside. I could put you in prison and I can change you all within 24 hours. They'll cut your hair, they'll put you in a jumpsuit, and they'll put on shoes on your feet, they'll tell you when to go to bed and when to get up and what you're going to eat, if you want to eat anything at all, what you're going to watch and when you're going to go to wreck and when you're going to go to medical and when you're going to do it. You're going to do everything they tell you to do if you're going to stay there. And if not, they'll put you in solitary confinement without laying a paw on you until you learn to do what they tell you to do. Otherwise, they'll let you sit in solitary and rot. You come out one hour a day. That's not the church at all. It's not here to bind you up, but it's also not going to be loose living. This idea, I can just do whatever it is I want to do. Now some of you, I already know, I can tell looking at your faces, you have this, this thing that's saying to me, I, I, I'm not even listening to you. Okay, well, that's fine. Who says it's me talking? What is it about what I'm saying that's irritating you so bad? The way I say it, I can't change the pitch of my voice. I'm not screaming at you and slobbering all over you, but some of you think that's what you're seeing. You're seeing big fangs out here and somebody... <laughs> that's what you're seeing because it's contrary to your flesh. It's not correct for you to stand on what God tells you to stand on. The Lord will take care of the rest of the stuff. Stop, stop being so interested in what everybody else is not doing that you are doing. Amen. Be like Mary and just sit at His feet and let the Lord take care of the rest of that stuff. If you'll remember correctly, the Lord did take a defense for her and said, leave her alone. Uh, let me ask you a question. Are you slipping? I don't know if you're slipping. I mean, from the looks of you, you look pretty good to me. You're in church today. You seem to be relatively interested. <laughs> I mean, so far, some of you are about ready to run out, but you know we'll talk about you if you do. <laughs> But, but, but let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. I, I know what y'all think. Yeah, that's what all Bible believers do. No, all Bible believers don't do that. I'm glad you're here. Don't falsely accuse me of something you don't know to be true. Ask me, do you talk about me? I'll tell you if I do. Don't just throw everybody in a pot and say, all Bible believers are hypocrites. All Bible believers are ne'er-do-well. All Bible believers are fake, phony put-ons. All Bible believers are that. Stop saying that kind of stuff. We are all of those things. Every one of us has been and is a hypocrite at one time or another. None of us keep it 100% of the time, all the time. I will admit to you, I do real good when I'm sleeping. But the rest of the time, it's subject to change. I think I'm doing pretty good and somebody pulls out in front of me. And I'm just saying, it's not always the right stuff that comes to my mind. I've prevented it from coming out of my mouth, but I'm working on, why did I think that in the first place? Amen. But can I just say this to you? Are you slipping? How's your prayer life? Is it better this year than last year? You have one individual you're praying for right now, you hope and pray the Lord will save them? Are you praying for them? Is that the top of your list? How's your prayer list? How's your giving of your time and your talent? 
Has it improved? You giving the Lord more time and study? And how are you doing on that? How are you doing on reading the Bible? Well, I read my one chapter every day. Okay. Is that where you are? If you're that way at work, that's why you're still the janitor. You think you should be the CEO, but you only do what you have to do every day to get your paycheck instead of saying, what can I do to improve myself? Amen. Go to school. Right. Take classes. Right. Do something that makes you a little bit more viable. Who wants to do that? Listen, ladies and gentlemen, the Christian life is not this life that people get this idea that it's like salvation. No, after salvation, it's all up to you. You're as close to Him as you want to be. And the problem is, is as we get older, you know that desire, your, your appetite, and especially your desire as far as dehydration is concerned, your thirst, uh, there's a fancy name for it, I can't think of the name of it, but the thing that makes you thirsty for water, as you get older, you know what happens? That thing begins to tone down, and that's why so many elderly people wind up getting dehydrated, because they just aren't thirsty like they used to be. Well, spiritually, you know what happens as you get older and you've been saved a long time? You know what happens? You're not thirsty anymore. You know what they do to make uh, animals that are dehydrated? Do you make them thirsty? You say, well, you lead them to the water. No, they don't. They put a salt lick out. And that horse or that cow hits that salt lick, and the next thing you know, that salt makes them thirsty. You have a one-to-four ratio in your system. That one-to-four ratio is, is for every carb you put in your body, there's four grams of water that goes with it to help it to make it soluble. That's why when you go lower carbs, you lose some of the water. You think you're losing a ton of weight, you're just losing a bunch of water. But the thing is, is that those things make you thirsty. You have to have it to make it soluble. Are you still thirsty like you used to be? Let him that is a thirst come unto me, and I'll give him the water of life. Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Are you thirsty? You know what he says? you got to move by the brook. What happened over there with Elijah? The brook dried up. It doesn't say the food stopped. The brook dried up. You can go without food a while, but you can't go without water. And the air, you got to have air. That'll last you about maybe 30 seconds, maybe as much as three minutes without brain damage. Uh, water you can do without for about three days. Food you can probably go 30 days or more without too much problem. But no more than about three days and then you're dehydrated. And when you get dehydrated, you act like a whack-a-mole, man. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. And I've seen it more with elderly people than I've seen it with uh, other people. Elderly people just aren't thirsty like they used to be. And when you try to get them to drink water, they think you're crazy. They're sloshing around. I don't need to drink water. Well, you do. You're dehydrated. All your symptoms and everything show when you're dehydrated. Your blood's thickened up and your blood pressure's down and you need to do the following things here and all that. You just need to drink some water. Help clean out your liver and your kidneys and all that other kind of stuff, you know. And and, and that kind of need to go see a nephrologist. That's a kidney doctor and that kind of a deal. And the doctor says, you know what you need? You need some water. You know what some of you need spiritually this morning? You need a drink of water. Amen. Elijah, you know what happens? He goes over there and with that biscuit, many people miss it. You know what's in that passage? There's a cruise of water. He gets in a tanglement over there with the Lord after the showdown at the OK Corral there on top of Mount Carmel. And when he wakes up, you know what's right by his head before he recognizes there's bread on the fire? You know what's right by his head? There's a cruise of water. You say, why? You know why? That man got dehydrated. He'd been walking in the desert all day. You know what the Lord said you need? You're thinking crazy because you need a drink yeah. of water. Amen. You know nothing or quench your thirst like water does? Amen. You try it. You drink a Coca-Cola or something like that. You drink one of these fancy drinks. You drink a Red Bull or whatever you folks drink nowadays. It's insane the amount of stuff that's in all that. And you drink that stuff and you're going back and hitting it again and hitting it again and hitting it again. You drink a glass of water and it satiates your thirst. That's how God made you. A counterfeit won't satiate your thirst. Satiate. That's just a big word for quench your thirst. You need a drink of water. When you get thirsty like that, you know what happens? You start acting the fool. You start doing some things you shouldn't. Are you slipping? How about telling others about Jesus? If that's a measuring stick. Are you telling more than you did? I'm not talking about telling them about some sporting event or some school event or some event that's taking place uh, socially or some get-together at uh, a park or whatever it might be. I'm talking about telling them about Jesus. The thing that really matters. 
Has that improved? You say, what? Well, that means your stand has been weakened. Do you understand? You're, do you understand? <laughs> do you understand? That means your position's been weakened. You're no longer talking about it. I learned a long time ago that you learn to talk about what you love. And you cease to talk about what no longer you love the way you used to love it. Boys, you still talk about your wife like you used to? In the same tone and in the same manner? She used to be that the sun rose and set in her eyes. And you told everybody about her and now she's the old bag or the ball and chain or... Do you still talk about the Lord the way He used to when He saved you? He still mean to you what He used to mean to you? You're slipping. You're slipping. Has He become a God of convenience for you? You come when, you, when it's convenient? Now, you'll be inconvenienced for everything else. Preacher, I'd love to come, but I'm too busy. i got this to do and that to do and that to and so on and so forth. I you think you can squeeze the Lord in your daytime or there. Well, I don't know, preacher. I can look and see, but I, I, I know I need to be there, but I can't be there. i got all these things going on. And besides that, all the hypocrites in the church and all the people that talk about me and all the people that did. I, you know what I figured out about that talking about you thing? I figured out you must think that everybody is like you. Because you must spend a lot of your time on Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat talking about everybody else. So you assume that everybody's talking about you the way that they talk, that you talk about them. That must be the problem. I've seen for years, I've seen a guy that's a con man. He always thinks he's being conned. He's always suspicious of somebody trying to... You know why I know that? I think it's because they've done that to other people. They think people are doing it to them. You've got a guilty conscience. You're kind of too close to the edge there. You might want to back away from that. You say, well, why, why do I see those things? Well, maybe it's because you are those things. It's easy to see the sins in others you're guilty of committing yourself. What is it you see in other people? Why do you think you see those things? Did you ever consider that you've now set yourself above those people and you think you're better than those people and you think you deserve better treatment than you've gotten? You ever, does that ever cross your mind? Or do you just think, well, I'm the one that's made the decision to, to make these decisions and I'll be the one that decides who's this? And Okay. But are you judging the way the book would judge? Let me ask you this. Do you forgive the way that God forgave? Be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. That means you're to forgive the way the Lord did. Why don't we camp out on that one a while? Beat the fire out of study in a flat earth. You know what I know about a flat earth? There's no conviction in it at all. I asked uh, Brother Sam to go through and pull down all the stuff. We have one guy that won't pull one thing down, but to pull all the stuff. I used to do all the stuff on the deeps and all the other kind of things. and that It's interesting stuff. I admit it's there. There's no question about it. I don't want to be known for that. All I'm doing is regurgitating stuff I was taught anyway. There's nothing new. Nothing bigger, big time new about it. I'd teach you folks, but I don't think I'd put it out over the internet. I don't want it to be copied and put up there. You know what I want to be up there? I want practical stuff to be up there. It draws you closer to Jesus Christ. That's what I want up there. That's what I'd like to be known for. Yeah, he's always pointing us back to Jesus. We just always pointing us back to Jesus and always questioning whether I'm tight with Jesus. And it's always about Jesus with that guy. Good, I'll take that. But all this other stuff... Okay, all that does is blow your mind up, and that's why we have double doors in the back, so you can get your head through the door. <laughs> You've got to be careful about that, especially ministering to people. When you're ministering to people, give them the practical stuff. Give them the stuff that helps them. Uh, people are struggling nowadays. All right, I got about 10 more of those things. I'll give you some of those uh, again tonight. We'll go ahead and take a, a short break here. Brother Larry will meet the men right out front under the portico.